Step right up and join the most vibrant circus community in the world, CircusTalk.com. This is In Center Ring. I'm your host, Jonathan Lee Iverson. He is the incurable dreamer with an unquenchable taste for wonder. She is the insatiably curious marvel enraptured by wonderlust. Together they've spawned a circus haven of dazzling feats and community. In Centauri presents Keith Nelson, Stephanie Monsieur, and the Bindle Stiff Family Circus. I think we're all enamored with how in the world do you do it? Every week, week in and week out, every Monday, live. You're doing circuit in a new way, variety shows in a, in a brand new way, and it's succeeding. How, I mean, how do you pull that off? I mean, basically, it started for me to keep my sanity um, because, you know, for 12 years, we've been doing a monthly variety show in New York City. Um, and it always, you know, it's a place for me just to try new material, to connect with everybody, a good place just to invite performers together to have that community. And then when the April show, you know, was coming around and like, oh my gosh, we can't bring our community together. Um, we started really just thinking pretty hard and said, oh, let's just try this virtual thing and see how it works. Our first show, I think was over two hours long. Um, but about halfway through, we just kind of came up with the idea, like we need to be doing this weekly. We need to have this community coming together. We need to see each other. We need to bring audience people to come to be with us again. We need performers just visually saying, are you okay? Yeah, you're okay, great. Are you still thinking about art? Great. Um, so we kind of just from that moment for, um, jumped onto it and it pretty much takes up almost every moment of my week just getting ready for the weekly show, um, helping folks learn how to use Zoom and then just finding the acts that are available with the uh, internet link to make it happen. Um, the exciting thing about it is that because it's online, we no longer have to fly folks in, deal with border checks. You know, I've been able to book acts from around the world to be a part of this. And um, I mean, it's just been, been kind of blowing my mind that, you know, just the folks that come together for it. And the simple fact that every week we get two to 500 people willing to sit in front of a computer for another hour and a half to watch right live acts. on a monday <laughs> on a monday i mean we've always done monday because that's the one day that i knew that i could afford entertainers you know that um because right. i did a saturday i can't afford people saturday right you're right <laughs> it's brilliant when did this partnership start stephanie keith and i met in 1990 late 93 or early 94. Each of us has a background that doesn't reflect traditional circus at all, but we together we found circus mm -hmm. as a means to really fulfill a lot of, I guess, creative ideas, but also, you know, spiritual need, like that, that sense of belonging and togetherness and um, mutual support and that, that feeling of like, fullness that you get when you when you work together with people and it like just feels good and that's you know so we like got together but we also began a family pretty shortly you know and that doesn't mean biological children for us that means this community that we belong to and this is how bindle stiff was born yeah yeah lots of lots of um people from kind of like the outliers of the New York nightclub scene, mm. drag queens, drag kings, poets, um, human beatboxers, uh, dancers, the odd, you know, people like Amanda Topaz was worked with us very early on. She's somebody who, you know, went to Circus Mercus as a youth and then trained with Irina Gold and had, you know, that connect connection to traditional circus. Um, she's the first one who turned me on to Circus Report back in like 94 or something like that. And I was just blown away that there was a newspaper for circus people. Yeah. It was like this juicy, delicious look at the circus community because, you know, it's very it was very inside. And, um, you know, that was something that we didn't feel very much a part of at that time. Hmm. And over time there, you know, New York City has a long tradition of circus like 
you know, in the seventies, there was a neo vaudeville movement, Javi Burgess and Philippe Petit were in New York in the seventies and, you know, late sixties doing Commedia dell'arte. Um, there was King Charles troop up in the Bronx that had been, you know, part of circus, you know, decades before we ever came around. So eventually we just started making these threads of connections to the bigger circus community. Um, and then also um, where we live in Brooklyn, three floors above us, there's another circus house. <laughs> um, they, they started circusing before us. It's Jennifer Miller with Circus Amok. And for folks that aren't familiar with Circus Amok, they're okay. um, a very socially conscious show that is doing free shows in the parks all over New York, making people think. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when you have, like, Jen at first was like, who are these folks behind, below me that are like crappy jugglers and this and that? And then, you know, over, <laughs> over years of practice, she was like, oh, okay, they, they're putting their time in. Um, and now we're like best of friends. We juggle all the time. We play music together. But I mean, we're the, as far as I know, the only building in New York City that houses two circuses. And they happen to be the two longest running shows in New York City right now. So looking forward, when we come out of this uh, National Day of Punishment, um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I guess I, I reckon that you will definitely um, expand upon the virtual offerings that you're giving in addition to getting back to the live show as well. Yes. I assume that we're, we will continue with the virtual. Personally, I want to smell my audience. I want to see them right in front of me. I want that connection. Um, and I'm, you know, it's, no matter how much I try to play with the Zoom, there's no way to have that reality. Um, on the flip side of that, the fact that we have fans who hadn't seen us in 20 years able to turn on their computer in Arizona and share a moment with us, um, to me is amazing just hearing older voices, both performers and fans connecting with us. So I have a feeling we'll try to figure out how to have that balance. Um, but I, you know, personally, I just can't wait till I'm either on a ring or in a stage or on a, in a field with the wind blowing in my hair and just, you know, doing it in that section and not trying to be careful of, I mean, right now, if I mess up, I knock over a computer, I pull a cable and the show's over. <laughs> Whereas if, you know, if I'm outside or on a stage and the power goes out and the sound goes out, you know, I'll pull out a little flashlight and the show will go on. So, you know, that's, I'm just looking forward to a day where technology is in our kill switch. Right. <laughs> in addition to all of us learning how to navigate the digital platform, most of us are also refiguring how to reach out a lot in live ways. One of the things that we did here in, um, you know, Bindlestiff is, is active in New York City and also in the upstate New York region. And we created a series of tiny parades in our, in our upstate community, um, just, you know, decked out stilt walkers. And these are youth from the community, young adults from the community that have been working with our circus after school program for many years, um, circus instructors. Um, we all got decked out in bells. We wore stilts, we wore giant big white wings and, and feathers and just, paraded through neighborhoods that were high density, lots of elders and children in big tall buildings came to their windows and just, you know, had this moment of surprise and like, we're not forgotten. We, we could send love out. Like moments like that were vital for us as the artists, but also, you know, help knit a community together in times when you don't feel together. And I think and I've heard a lot of other circus people doing things like this. There are pop-up performances in Central Park. There are pop-up performances along the East River. Um, I heard about an amazing circus in a junkyard in Las Vegas with performers <laughs> on top of trucks and you know piles of stuff. It's happening all over the place. And the beautiful thing about circus, whether you're from a traditional background or you come to it later, is that circus people are so resourceful and so creative. And because we do have that, I do everything from A to Z. I'll drive the truck, I'll sew the costume. Like we can just make it work. So we don't need to re refer to our unions for it. I, I can't do that. <laughs> exactly. It's my union contract. <laughs> I, you know, I, I love this that you all have basically these split communities. So you have. Um, a community happening in Brooklyn and one upstate. And so I'm curious to know, especially for those who are probably uh, 
who have an itch to start their own thing. And especially now, I don't want to assume that you just had bags of money somewhere and, or you were able to just, you know, but how do you, um, yeah, how do you galvanize the, I guess, the fortitude to just, you know, take it and create basically two communities? I mean, it, we started as in kind of a punk rock band mentality of let's throw some amazing artist in a van, hit the road and see what happens. <laughs> um, and, you know, at that point, there, you know, there were towns that if we didn't get an audience, we would be stuck in that town because we didn't have enough gas money to get to the next town. Um, we actually showed up in Louisiana and the venue had burnt down. We basically had a quarter of a tank in the gas tank and probably 20 bucks amongst all of us and literally went out to the power, um, like went out to the pa um, power poles, plugged in, got, you know, gypsy, all this um, electricity and did a show in a burnt out shell so that we could, you know, first of all, entertain and get it out of our system, but more importantly, to be able to get the budget to stay on the road. Um, and that's kind of been, are, are sort of tacked all the way of just like full speed forward, damn the torpedoes and, you know, we're going to do it. Um, and luckily just the community love kind of keeps us driving. I mean, the, you know, the energy of who we put in that van is really the crucial thing. And then as we take on bigger projects, just having that team of people that you can trust that wants to create and that money's not really the situation. Um, I mean, like, you know, right now, many of the Monday night shows don't break even. We, we do our best to pay every act $100 just to be a part of it um, and really don't want to pay anybody less than that. And even that feels like not enough. Um, but it's just, um, I don't know, I was just kind of brought up of putting community above everything else. Mm. And somehow it's gotten me to half a century old and still eating and um, being able to do it. I think that there are also really strong mentors out there in the circus community. And, you know, when we started, it was 20, it was 25 years ago. And we, there wasn't the internet, there weren't the ways to connect that there are now. I think it, you know, now you can easily reach out to people anywhere in the world and, and say, how did you do it? What are you doing? How's this working for you? Can we collaborate? I say like, you know, ask around, talk to people, build a community, get together, be willing to share the burden, you know, be willing to ask for help, be willing to ask questions. Circus is a circle. It's not a triangle. Like there's, you know, it's not about like one person having an idea and, and you know, exclusively running the show. It's for us, it's always been like this, and that's how I think it works for us. Yes, welcome to their TED Talk. This is it's quite a lesson because, I mean, how do you get people to believe in what you're selling? <laughs> and to the point where you're taking them to different venues, you don't really know what's going to happen. You get there and it's burnt down. All right, this is my theory. And this is why Bindlestiff has, has attracted such a, di a diverse community of people, like ages, sizes, shapes races, backgrounds, you know, nationalities, we're not gonna, we're not writing a show and telling you what to do in it. Hmm. This is about pure collaboration. This is about what do you think? What's, what's your, what's your superpower? What do you, what do you want to bring to this? What do you want to say? How can, how can this work together? And I, from the very beginning, we've always had the kinds of shows that were written by the cast, by the crew, not, not a dramaturg, not, you know, we never had a director. We, you know, the cast, the group was self-directed. And I'd say over time, you know, like the, the production value changes and you, and there's different ways to collaborate with other artists or a, an artist like a director. Um, but I think that's essentially the, the secret is like everybody has to feel free to be themselves and say what they need to say and feel like they're getting their, their well filled by being part of this. That's why they take the risks. Like, like when we were in production, um, our director and the roustabouts pretty much have the same amount of voice. Like if you have a notion, an idea, get it out there. You know, there's, um, I mean, it's just, it's kind of the beauty of the meetings. And then you'll watch this idea from, you know, the first year juggler that's all of a sudden becoming this massive thing. Um, I mean, it's just kind of a beautiful thing where to hear all the voices at the table. 
the name Bindle Stiff, where does it come from? Oh, it's, um, it means hobo or vagabond. It's actually the stick and the bundle that, um, that a okay. hobo would carry. Okay. And it, was, it became a really popular word, word between um, Civil War and World War I when the rail riding community was out there. And it um, also was a way of communicating and workers' rights were being discussed, you know, as the rails, like, so we kind of it pretty much just made sense. I mean, in the earliest um, realm of kind of the early days of Bindlestead, it was Stephanie and I with one case of costumes and one case of pyrotechnics, hitchhiking, jumping on trains, like we went out to Burning Man. Um, and, you know, so like the earliest things with the two of us trying to figure out how to get in, down the road without a vehicle. Yeah, this is a TED Talk for sure. This is something <laughs> else. <laughs> the, the, um, the notion, though, of the, you know, America between the, the, the Civil War and the First World War were, was also about huge social change and, you know, the accessibility of people to be able to work and the the fact that people were now forced to, there were migrations happening in a lot of different ways in, in that, in that chunk of time in that like 80 years and, or, you know, 60 to 80 years and people were reevaluating what it meant to be rooted in community or have to move to work. Um, and the, the, the rail riding community, the, the, the travelers were the first to really organize themselves and through the graffiti that they would write on the railroad bridges or whatever, and in the rail yards, they would communicate to each other about, you know, safe communities where you wouldn't be persecuted by cops, where people might, you know, be willing to share a meal, where you could actually find work, you know, whether people were racist or not, whether they were going to run you back out of town the minute you set foot down there. And through that, um, developed this, I, this traveling community of people that took care of each other and provided for each other and left root markers along the way. <laughs> I mean, kind of like what circus does. And um, that, that very much appealed to our sense of, um, you know, um, community. Please tell me about, you know, that moment for you when you knew, okay, I have to do, this is my life. This is the lifestyle I want to lead. Um, there were a few moments in my youth that I think planted the seed, one of which is I was probably about nine years old and my parents gave me an Emmett Kelly ventriloquist doll. <laughs> Looking back, I have no idea why you would make a ventriloquist doll from a silent clown, but at least at nine, that part of the argument wasn't, a, wasn't there. A couple years later, we went to see a mud show and you could pay 25 cents to see the elephant dog. I was so excited. I went there with my 25 cents. I gave it to the went around the, um, the canvas and behind there, there was a shaved dog. And it was at that moment that I realized that you could shave a dog and make a living. So we're gonna jump forward now, um, now uh, um, probably, I don't know, a decade or so. I'm at um, Hampshire College, I'm getting into the Grateful Dead and I learned how to do a double stick. And that was kind of my gateway prop that led on to all of this. Um, my best friend in college was a juggler, David Hunt, who um, was one of the early um, presidents of ICO, and he's now part of Prescott Circus, is I think they're um, basically running the program. Um, but he got me into juggling, then I traded a bottle of whiskey for, with a bunch of jugglers for a fire eating lesson. And then once I left Hampshire, I had two marketable skills, juggling and eating fire. Um, moved to New York City, and um, a little bit soon after that met Stephanie. I was really searching for something. I was in art school at the time. I was at FIT in New York City. I was a metalsmith and a jeweler and I was working with flame and, you know, alloying metals and this, you know, this elemental kind of creative phase. I got hit by a car and broke uh, my arm and couldn't finish my degree. It was like finals week. Mm. And, um, in the interim of healing and trying to get back to that, I realized I didn't want to sit at a, at a desk, you know, like at a bench looking down at engagement rings for the rest of my life. And um, I started doing larger scale drawings and, and kind of like imagining something that was more akin to performance art. And I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to get involved in it. 
But as a kid, I had loved sports. I had loved dance. I was, a, you know, I took gymnastics, ballet. Um, you know, I was a downhill skier. I was all about this adrenaline stuff, you know. And the jock side and the art artist side kind of found each other when I discovered, when I met Keith and found out like what juggling is and what fire eating, that was the first thing. My gateway drug was fire eating. <laughs> um, but then I found out about juggling and like stilt walking and trapeze and, you know, all the heavy, all the really intense physicality of circus that re that also requires like a poet's soul and the faith that, you know, over the arc of practice, you know, like you, this process of practice, like leads you to a place where you could, you couldn't even imagine you could go like all of those. I didn't have language for that back then, but all of those things are, are now I understand like are what came together and meeting Keith was like, here's this kindred spirit who, you know, was just so open-minded and, and had this vision of being able to do, uh, you know, performing, perform in public for people in the public sphere, like sort of prankster, you know, taking public space and making weird things happen. And that's how it really started. And um, over the years, my, you know, like my heart really, I feel you're, you're a ringmaster. You've stood up in front of thousands of people and heard that, that power, like the school the children, the, the, the people, you know what that feels like. That's just, it's a tidal wave of love. And I, I really have enjoyed that on a much smaller scale, but teaching and working with youth who also like, there's a lot of kids who, if they have some connection with uh with something that they can love or people who can support them they they may avoid that kind of path that i took and that's where like my um my real soul is now is like working with youth being in community um showing an alternative um you know you watch somebody do what they love and it inspires love and use so like mm. you know they don't have to run away and join the circus but you know, maybe they discover something else about themselves in the process of learning, taking risks. So um, that's why like today, Bindlestiff has three main platforms, I think. Like one is youth and community programming that includes after school programming and also working with adults with neurodiversity um, and developmental diversity. And there is an emerging artist platform which provides grant funding for people developing circus work you know, in, in their, in their emerging phase. And then there's like this creation of original shows that we've always done for 25 years. So what, like, what's not to love? You can do anything in this, in this sphere. You know, you, you did get close to my heart ringmaster. So I, I do want to touch on your uh, wonderful career as a uh, the, the woman in the top hat, um, because the, the reality is um, it's, I don't want to say it's rare, but it is, <laughs> you know, we don't always see women in the forefront uh, making the announcements and there have been in some wonderful, uh, wonderful ringmasters who've done it. Um, you followed in the footsteps of uh, a wonderful uh, Vanessa Thomas when you uh, ventured over to Big Apple Circus. And that was a lot of that was wonderful. And I regret I didn't get to see you actually perform. I have the picture of you and Miss Thomas together. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this is it. I mean, such beauty and such history. Please give us that inside of what, what it feels like to, you know, put the tails on, put the top hat on and to basically uh, to lead. I've had the privilege of doing that for my own show for a very long time. And to uh you know Bindlestiff it has always performed in non-traditional circus venues whether it be you know bar nightclub theater field uh you know not not tented not sidewall just kind of like out there and um you know burned out warehouses whatever it is and and I really always had the dream of the tent and one of my earliest memories is going to a circus in Western Massachusetts with my grandfather 
and you know the light coming through the 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 red and white striped canvas and the sawdust and the and the the bleachers and just kind of like that haze of dust in the air when the animals run through like all of that was very dreamy and and when the opportunity to work in the big apple tent came along it was it just brought another layer of of dimensionality because it's a different way of connecting with people we've we've generally worked either in a three-quarter round or on a stage which is a you know it's it's a there's a gap there's a there's a flat divide there there's a wall a fourth wall if you will and the ring is is the ring it is the place in which you are literally surrounded i mean the band's behind you so you're still you know there's still people all around you and that just feels so amazing. And it was a learning curve to learn how to really be in that space and make sure to include everybody and, and make everybody feel connected too. And I, I always felt like the job of the ring, ring mistress, no matter if I'm where I am, is to make sure to connect with every single person. And, and I'm not gonna tell you how to, how to have the experience, but I want you to like, you, here, Here's some freedom, like take whatever you can out of this and dream with it, keep it, be lifted by it, be inspired and, um, you know, go home with some wings that you can use in your own, your own way. And uh, I've, I felt like, a, you know, a conduit for something bigger. And that, and it goes both ways. You know, the audience, they give you and you give it right back or, you, you know, I get to keep some. And I remember like early on having those butterflies and just feeling like stage fright. And this is way back in the way, but way before, um, you know, like probably 20 years ago. And somebody said to me, it's not fright. You are receiving energy hmm. and your job is to give it back. And so I've never forgotten that. And uh, that's what it feels like. And do I, oh I miss that to a certain extent, but I, I still feel that a little bit. I'm stealing that. I like that. <laughs> it's not fear. It's, it's, it's energy. I like that. Share that. You know, I've, t I've told that to many young people that I've worked with or, or like up and coming artists who, I mean, we, we do a, a professional platform for, for youth who want to become circus professionals and I've talked before the curtain many times with young people the first time they're you know holding a mic or stepping in front of a crowd that's all it is it's love like I, I really believe that the public comes to the circus not not to see what's gonna happen you know that kind of like ooh, they could fall I really believe they want you to win they want to see you fly. They want to see success. They want to see themselves reflected in that. And so that's what you're getting is love. And that's what your, your job is to give it back. Keith, I, I want to call you the Johnny Carson of circus lately. <laughs> no, <laughs> I've been the Casey Kasem recently. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I could buy that. Let, let's fuse them together. I, I've watched you and I'm just, I'm baffled by it. I'm like, wow, this is like, it's so seamless. It, you know, I'm like, at first I thought it was pre-recorded because it was really seamless. Even the things you've had to cover, you know, I, I thought, <laughs> okay, he covered that. You know, and few people can catch that, but I'm like, wow, okay, this is seamless. I mean, and you keep the same energy every time. And I think that to me is most remarkable considering you don't have it coming back at you. So You have to see my energy the 20 minutes before the show. That changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, you know, the key for, for this one is, uh, you know, I think with all Bindlestiff projects is bringing the, a great team together. And with the open stage, there's no way on earth I could do this without um, Elia Bisker, John Huntington, No Bailey, and, and Chris Diaz. These are the tech folks who in April said, we're going to learn how to do the Zoom thing. And every week come in with like, hey, Zoom just added this new little feature, or I just found out you could do it this way. Um, so, I mean, we're still in development, you know, first of all, Zoom keeps changing the platform, mm -hmm. which annoys us. Um, and then we have to figure out how to make all the tech work around that. But we're, you know, we're all into it or another performer says, hey, I know how to do it this way. Um, 
but it's, I mean, the, you know, watching the first show compared to now, you see that we've learned a lot. Um, but the same energy comes out because, I mean, every show I get to start the show off by seeing eight people that I love or 10 people or 12 people all here on the screen. And like, we're about to do something together that's creative. Folks have said, hey, can I just send in a video? And I'm like, no, it's not. You know, for me, the crucial thing is, I mean, I'm glad we ha have an audience. I'm glad that people love it. But what keeps me going is the fact that I'm bringing eight to 15 living human beings together into our little bitty windows to create something that is hopefully beautiful and touching. I like how you look at him, by the way, Stephanie. I'm, I'm watching. Because <laughs> you're really in love with that that. Just that, you know, it's community that that's your that's your that's your turn on It's community. I've always said circus is the ideal community, warts and all. It, it's the ideal community. If you wanted to really draw out how the world should work, I mean, it, it should be a circus, um, you know, really pulling from each other's particular and peculiar gifts. There is no real hierarchy in a circle. It's just, look, what do you bring to this circle? And nothing is insignificant. You know, nothing really is insignificant. Just to hear you talk about everybody coming together and say, well, we'll just learn this tech stuff. We'll learn what to do. You know, I think that is the hallmark of great community and how we continue to advance and how we continue to evolve. And speaking of which, community, 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 this October 17th, will be a fantastic event where we want all the communities, everybody coming on out to the Bindle Stiff Gala. Um, please tell us about it. Uh, tell us about your wonderful host. The whole thing, we, we, we want to hear about it. <laughs> we are so thrilled because not only do we have an incredible lineup of events, for this brief hour of our gala, we have the one and only Jonathan Lee Iverson hosting the gala with your bright, sparkling shine, your energy, your loquacious wonder. <laughs> it's going to be so much fun. And I think there are a few surprises in store for folks. Absolutely. Um, and us ringmasters are going to have a little... Uh, a little something up our collective sleeves um, and Keith is going to be Keith has worked really hard to put together an incredible uh, video with Chris Diaz that will kind of show a little bit more about what Bindlestiff has been doing for 25 years and and uh, what where we hope we end up so we're really excited there are some really cool sponsorship levels available and um, there's an artist uh, discount rate ticket and don't be shy about using that. We want people to, you know, we want you more than your money. So let us know if, if that's, you know, we want to stay open and uh, flexible about that. Um, and there's a link at bindlestiff.org slash gala. Wonderful. And there's, um, I would say there's, um, we're also doing a silent auction, which has some phenomenal workshops and posters and ephemera, a signed circus technique book by Hubby Burgess. Um, so, I mean, even if you can't make it to the gala, you know, still buy a ticket so you're supporting all of our work. But for those that are, in, um, that are collecting or looking for experiences, also check out our auction because there's some pretty phenomenal circus trinkets there. This is a people business. And I'm just, you know, again, I'm in awe of what you all do every week because you have to get a whole new roster every week. Yeah, there's some repeat performers or what have you. But that means you've actually cultivated enough relationships where you can call out to folks and they'll show up and they'll be a part of what you're presenting. I think it's a wonderful thing. Can you really speak to that and the importance of, you know, remembering your friends? I want to start real briefly because um, like as much as I've been talking about community, I also have to admit that over, over these years, I have learned a lot of st stuff about myself that wasn't working. You know, like there are some aspects of my personality that are counter to building community. Like I, I get really, 
I can get really controlling some, you know, like I, I want things my way. I'm stubborn. That doesn't work in community. Like it's, and, and like the willingness to be able to learn about oneself Mm -hmm. and do some deep work in oneself is what it takes to build relationships. And, you know, in show business, there, there, there's a little bit of competition. There's, there's, you know, there's some insecurity, like I'm getting old I'm, you know, I gained some weight. I'm not going to get hired. Oh, I have to cover my gray. Nobody wants to see tattoos, like whatever it is, there's always something that makes you not perfect. And the, you know, that, that fear of you know, being judged or not being enough or not being perfect is the thing that really keeps us separate from each other. And, to, you know, we were talking before about making space where people can really be themselves and feel safe to be themselves. That's the essence. And unless you're comfortable with yourself, unless I'm good with me, I'm not going to be good with you. And I'm going to find more than the obvious reasons, you know, like I'm a woman, you're a man, I'm a, you know, I'm a New Yorker, you're, you're West Coast, whatever it is. I'm going to find so many reasons that it's not, it's not going to work between us. And It's that, you know, that I call it cosmic stinginess. Like I'm, I'm a female ringmaster. If another female ringmaster comes on the scene, I'm not going to get any work. Like she's going to be better. She's going to be cooler. People are going to think she's, you know, like that's got to go. We have to, you know, love and support each other for all the gifts we have. And that's the essence in my understanding of like being able to be part of a community. One thing, um, kind of talking about community, but also tapping into our traditions and our history when Steph was mentioning in the mid nineties, like learning about circus report, um, Bindle Stiff came into being kind of in this weird period of circus. You know, um, we saw the, the traditional big East before us, Circus and Muck had been at it for a few years here. Jim Rose was just beginning to kind of be out there. Circus Soleil was just beginning to come out there. So it's kind of this weird, period before we started calling it contemporary circus happening and you had the traditional circus realm and we went very much out of our way to tap into the traditional community creating this kind of bridge um, hanging out with Lenorma Fox um, one of my first bosses was Ward Hall where I got to find out that 25 shows a day was average <laughs> um, and you know what living I mean you know, we've, we've spent a night or two, don't tell Kenneth, the, on the wrangling train, sleeping in somebody else's thing. You know, so we got to experience all of these, but if you've, um, for, for anybody in the industry that has not slept next to Queen Kong in the sideshow tent, um, you know, like it's a whole different level when you're sleeping with a sideshow as opposed to sleeping with a circus. But it was connecting to just that history and the individuals and, you um, making the folks that have done it for the 80, 100 years before us know that we care and love where they come from. And, you know, learning to do a one-handed clove hitch on a tent stake, you know, there's nobody in the contemporary cir- circus that would teach me that. But Jimmy Long with Ward Hall was like, come on, boy, I'll show you. <laughs> um, and just, yeah, making friends and learning from everybody. Can I also add that, and I, I do want to go here just a little bit, um, that, You know, circus has some unpleasant history, too, just as the rest of American culture does. And, you know, the the deep divide that has been encountered by circus artists of color, producers of color, directors, clowns, um, performers, lighting technicians, um, you know, in in the greater entertainment industry, there's there's no difference in circus. Like, I think we are we do a little bit better maybe because of, you know, family relationships and, but we could do better. We could always do better. And, um, and again, that I, the, where I see that work necessary is like each individual looking inside themselves, realizing that, you know, we are connected in ways that go far beneath what we wear, who we vote for, what color our skin is. And that it's that, love of circus, love of each other, love of, um, you know, creating and building together that, you know, that we find here that I think is going to be the, the power that brings us together and, and lets us build a future for circus that's strong and inclusive and based on 
trust and uh, and uh, you know the mutual goal of expression and yeah, beautiful art. And the, and we celebrate the artists that I think walk across the Bindlestiff stage. When I look at 25 years of who's been on stage and where they are now, it continues to blow me away. Um, 20 some years ago, we met this drag queen blue poet who, you know, we started inspiring, say, um, who became a clown for a short while and then became Scotty the Blue Bunny and was able to join us a, a month ago online. For, he's now living in Berlin, rocking, at, rocking it out as Scotty the Blue Bunny and has been his power character for 20 years there. Um, Eric Davis, who went on to be with Cirque, we, you know, we saw him in his earliest period of buffooning on our stage. Um, and just, you know, being able to just enjoy watching people grow in their career. I think we were the first people to ever give Michelle Matlock a check for clowning. Um, mm. And then she went on for, what, a decade with Cirque du Soleil as Ladybug. Um, and just time and time again, you know, these friends who step up on the stage and we just make art together. And then 10 years later, when I look at the big picture of Circus, I'm like, Bindlestiff, Bindlestiff, Bindlestiff. And just, ah, uh, touches my heart. Well... Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, there are Keith Nelson and Stephanie Monceau. I love saying your name. <laughs> Bindle Stiff Circus. Black experience in circuses go back hundreds of years, uh, and we do it with our with our own style. The circus has been a microcosm of the outside world. Many of the same prejudices are, are that you see in the outside world are present in the circus. So it's moving past the vision or the limited vision that the society has for you and stepping into the talent and skill that you know you have to go forward as a performer. The circus is a vast international community and there's only one place to connect for jobs, events, the latest news, and so much more. CircusTalk.com Join today.